The following video contains spoilers. We suggest watching the episodes alone in the dark. Hello, Wolfpack! We're back! And today, we're going all the way to the beginning to explore the very first tale from R.L. Stein's forgotten horror series, The Nightmare Room. In this tale, former childhood icon Amanda Bynes and her family move into a haunted house that hides a ghostly presence toying with their minds. But more importantly, is it still a good episode by today? Well, that's what we plan to find out. Everyone voted for this episode to be reviewed next, but some people have warned me that they wanted this tale to be reviewed and out of the way before I get to the good episodes later. Not a very reassuring sign. I hope all the people who voted for this tale are happy, since it took forever to get to it. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this Nightmare Room adventure in particular, all I can say is that this story is the prototype hybrid of Checking Out and My Old House from the oh-so-classic Haunting Hour series. Despite my heckling over on that show, both of those episodes were fantastic, so that surely means this story is great too, right? Um, let's stop wasting time and begin. Much like all the other tales of R.L. Stein, this one was also based upon a novel, so it'll be judged as an adaptation like Locker 13 was. So let's move out. Was this adaptation an underrated, unsettling classic worthy of positive attention? Or is it all just a forgotten memory being phased away by the passage of time? We'll see. This is my review on the Nightmare Room's very first episode, Don't Forget Me. So, our episode opens up with an innocent, naive family moving into a scary new house. Stop! Stop! Are we really doing this setup again? Seriously? The naive family moving into a spooky new house cliché? How many times are we going to do this, people? There are so, so, so many horror stories that have this basic overused premise that it starts to lose originality. The foolish family moving into a spooky haunted house is so overdone now that this setup just loses a ton of impact since the audience can guess instantly that of course the house is haunted by evil supernatural entities and our heroes are in grave danger the second they set foot in that setting. So yeah, Don't Forget Me has an overdone cliched beginning. Not a very strong start. But we soon meet our main characters, the Warner family. <coughs> this is our main character, Danielle Warner, played by Amanda Bynes. For those of you who are too young to know, Amanda Bynes was once a famous child star who was a huge hit on television and dominated popularity on Nickelodeon. Sadly, like most child actors, her star burnt out, and she fell on hard times. Fortunately for us, this episode was made back in the day when Miss Bynes used to be talented, so she is a pretty decent actor here, and a worthy guest star for the show. Also, Danielle's father is actually played by Jim Meskimen, one of the greatest voice actors ever. He played such characters like Mumra from the anime Thundercats, and additional voices on other shows we've all probably watched. But sadly, this story was filmed before he became famous, so he doesn't exactly do anything that grand outside of being another generic parent character. Yeah, a guy who is as talented at voice acting as Tom Kenny is just a generic idiot parent. But it does give me some hope, since the Warner family is made up of actors who can give passable performances. So bravo, Nightmare Room. 
This has been another segment of Cat's Pointless Horror Trivia. Alright, back to the plot. Danielle Warner is an average kid who no one understands, but she actually likes moving here since it means she'll be closer to her friends, where we meet her idiot friend Chris and they catch up on things. But we also see a creepy homeless guy observing the family across the street. Danielle's parents encourage the kids to explore the big haunted house alone for fun while they work on moving some boxes. Oh, don't you talk about my boxes! I like boxes! So the kids naturally go down into the dark, creepy basement, only to get jump-scared by Danielle's annoying... This is Peter, who is kind of a trickster character who loves trolling his big sister. But in true ironic fashion, his trickery will backfire on him later. Danielle complains about how much she hates the spooky basement and her whiny brother before leaving. But as the kids head up, Peter hears some scary voices calling to him, causing him to run away in fear. But once the room is empty, we see that this basement has a few interdimensional cracks in the floor. Oh no, it's the fabric of reality tearing itself apart, like in Futurama. But enough of that nightmare, because we cut to the next day, where Danielle's parents are heading off. But our hero reminds them that they forgot to say goodbye to them, which has never happened before. The parents say their goodbyes, but also tell the kids that they're going on a long trip for work, meaning that the kids will be all alone in the house for a few days, and they remind them to stay safe. Oh boy, I sure hope this won't lead to any supernatural hijinks. Danielle's idiot friend comes by to score with her, but they see the creepy homeless guy watching them from afar. But they ignore him and go hang out inside, since they have more important stuff to do. Like having Danielle practice her amateur hypnosis skills on her idiot brother. Yeah, for reals, the haunted house plot takes a brief pause for this side story of Danielle training herself in hypnosis. Because we weren't entertained enough. The teens hypnotize Peter to fall asleep, but when they try to snap him out of it, the boy doesn't wake up. Oh no! Yeah, Peter is actually faking it just to troll them. This is all a long, pointless fake-out scene where the show pretends that Danielle's hypnosis warped the kid's mind, but he's really screwing with them. Now, in the book, Danielle hypnotizing her brother was meant to be a clever misdirection since the haunted house plays these disturbing mind games with the Warner family as well. We're led to question whether or not if the haunted house is real or if it was just Danielle's hypnotizing making Peter hallucinate all the spooky shenanigans. It's a mind screw plot. However, it doesn't work on the TV version because the show staff already revealed that the house is alive and haunted long before this hypnosis subplot plays out, rendering this whole fake out entirely pointless. Thanks for ruining a potentially cool misdirection, writers. After revealing that he trolled them, Danielle tries smacking Peter, but she accidentally breaks a family picture, so she tries hiding it in the trash to cover her mistake up. Oh, and apparently her idiot friend leaves because seeing a broken family picture is just too much for him. Thanks for being useless, guy. 
However, as Danielle trashes the broken portrait, she encounters the scary homeless man and runs away. But the homeless man tries pleading for her attention, arguing that he needs to speak with her since he wants to help Danielle. But she's having none of that. And here is where we get to one of the worst parts of this whole episode. The creepy homeless man is by far one of the worst actors I have ever seen from this show. Quite possibly in my whole life. The guy playing the homeless man is absolutely terrible at acting. And the fact that this guy is supposed to be a very integral part to the whole story only makes things worse. I mean, just gaze upon the homeless guy's gripping, award-winning performance. This guy is awful, and the fact that he's supposed to be the most important part in this story made this episode all the more unbearable to watch. Not once do you feel emotionally invested in this guy's acting. Not one line is said with the seriousness it's meant to have. And not once do you feel like this guy is trying to help these people out since all he does to win Danielle over is stalk her and harass her like a perverted weirdo. I don't think I'm spoiling anything when I say that the big twist to this homeless guy is that he's secretly a good guy because the show does a bad job foreshadowing that point with his obvious dialogue. My point is that the homeless guy was one of the best characters in the book version, but the TV version downgraded him into the worst character. It is that bad, everyone. Every time he acts so badly, it legitimately makes Tommy Wiseau look like Heath Ledger in comparison. Big shock, the homeless guy fails to win Danielle's trust, probably because stalking her and trying to break into her house was a bad move. So Danielle locks down the fort before finding Peter gone, only to discover him in the basement via a jump scare. However, Peter has no memory of who he is, or why he even came down to the basement at all. But Danielle takes him to bed so he can rest his head. But we then see the portal to hell growing bigger. But who cares, since the kids start catching some Z's. But as our hero tries sleeping this madness off, the walls begin to ooze green slime. Ew, that sticky goo looks a little phallic to me. Danielle wakes up and assumes that it was all just a dream, while the house slurps its slime back up. Okay? Danielle searches the entire house for Peter as the house trolls her. Ooh, look out everyone, the house knocked over a picture. Scary stuff. Even I can beat that. Look, I'm running with scissors. She eventually finds Peter heading down to the basement again, but Danielle never questions this at all and tells him to go back to bed, but Peter has no memory of where his room is. The next day, Danielle calls her idiot friend over to help. Yes, instead of, oh, I don't know, calling a doctor, she calls her idiot best friend for help. 
Well, I'm sure the real doctor would tell her that his illness is just a temporary virus and have him wait it out, just like how Luke Green got cured. Of course. Anyways, Danielle tells her dopey friend that Peter has gotten worse since he's dazed and losing consciousness, while for some reason, she can't remember her parents' cell phone number anymore. They see how Peter's doing, revealing that the little bro can't even remember his gaming skills, and he completely fails to recognize the two teens. The idiot friend thinks that Peter's simply trolling them again, but Danielle thinks that her hypnosis has changed her little bro, even though at this point, we all know that it's clearly the house's work, since it showed off all of its magical powers earlier to show that it's alive, yet the plot still wants us to think that this story is all a mind screw and how Danielle's hypnosis is a possible red herring to explain this. Look, guys, I know I nitpicked how Mild House wasted the great mind screw potential of whether or not the Demon House was real, but at least the writers waited until the halfway point to reveal that the house was indeed alive. This story sets up the chance that the house could actually be haunted, or it's just Danielle's hypnosis deteriorating their minds. But the episode goes out of its way to show that the haunted house is real right from the start. You're not fooling anyone with this misdirection. The book did this well, but again, R.L. Stein's books are written from the perspective of the main characters, while the TV series has the ability to show us everything that's going on, even when the Warner siblings aren't on screen. This subplot is not helpful, since it goes nowhere and is disproven easily. Oh, and here's the part that completely destroys the maybe it's all the hypnosis plot thread. The next day, when Danielle goes to pick up Peter at school, the school secretary tells Danielle that they have no file or any evidence that Peter was ever enrolled at their school like he never existed. Yes, no joke, the magic house has the power to alter school records and erase everyone's minds, even if they were never in the house at all. Remember this point, because it comes back to punch a huge plot hole in this tale later. Danielle panics and runs home to find her brother missing, where she, of course, goes down into the dark basement, only to discover Peter as a bad CGI ghost. This is the big twist, folks. The haunted house eats the souls of children, and those dimensional cracks on the floors were the lost spirits of kids eaten by the house trying to grab more victims for the house to consume. The people devoured by the building become its puppets that the house uses to lure in even more people to eat as they slowly erase the memories of its food and purges the memories of the victim's friends and family members, so they won't ever find them after the house devours them. The house eats children? What a freak! It's not normal like us, right, Alice? Yeah, this is our big monster, folks. A living haunted house that eats the souls of children and alters everyone's memories to prevent its exposure to the real world. An interesting concept for sure, but one that is riddled with more plot holes than even the worst haunting our tales. Danielle screams and runs away once the ghosts and the demon house try getting her, but alas, she's locked in, but then she levels up with the crowbar and breaks out. 
In all honesty, this was a pretty scary scene, since Danielle is now fighting for her life and being forced to abandon her brother to Lord knows what evil forces, only so she can get to safety to think of a way to overcome this horror. It's surprisingly well done, and pretty creepy. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to win me over when we carry on to the grand climax of this tale. So Danielle runs away to her idiot best friend for help, rescuing her brother Peter. But he reveals that he has no memory of who Peter is. Yep, the house can also alter the memories of people outside of the building. This house is actually more overpowered than the Haunting Hour house. Dang it, my Warcraft training hasn't paid off. So Danielle runs away again, but for some reason, she's now carrying her school backpack, even though she didn't have it on earlier. Great continuity! Yes, seriously, she's suddenly wearing her school backpack in her running shots, but once she stops to talk with people, the bag is gone. How do you not catch on to that error? However, she's jumped by the crazy homeless man, who finally reveals that he's a good guy who was just trying to help her all along. The homeless man tells her that he remembers her and her missing brother since he's aware of the house's magic powers. How does he know all this? Well, the homeless guy tells her that he was once a child who lived at the haunted house too, and lost his entire family to it. He escaped its clutches and studied it for his entire life to find a way to defeat it. The stranger informs us that the house is a living sentient being called a memory house, which feeds on souls to live and enhance its great powers. It erases everyone's memories so they'd forget the children or other people it lures inside to consume and digest their souls for all eternity. The cracks in the floors are really the victims desperately attempting to escape its hellish stomach, but the house can also turn them into puppets to aid its alluring factor. The memory house has done this time and time again, but the homeless man believes that the only way to stop it is to get people to remember the lost souls it took away. How does the homeless man hold on to his memories? Because he's really one of the ghost children who escaped the demon's prison. But naturally, this entire awesome scene is totally destroyed by this guy's atrocious acting skills. No! I know about your brother. The house where you're living. The forget-me house. You're nuts. Let me go! There is something about it. It makes the children living there forget everything, even who they are. No! It's happening to you, and I can see it in your eyes. I... It's true. The children themselves are forgotten, even by their parents, and then they sneak into the cracks of the basement floor. How do you know? Because I'm one of them. They have your brother! They want you! Great job winning her over, dude. I'm so certain your team-up will be believable and well-earned now. As awesome as this epic plot twist is, it's ruined by a number of negative traits in this episode. The big one being the homeless guy's bad, bad acting. This is supposed to be the most emotional scene in the whole story, and this guy gives such a restrained performance that it all falls flat. Even worse, this is a scene where the episode fails as an adaptation. This was not only one of the greatest parts of the original novel, but by far the saddest scene in the whole Nightmare Room series overall. Danielle is alone, lost and confused, fearing that she'll never see her little brother or parents ever again. But then, all of a sudden, this scary homeless man comes by, where we find out that he was not only a good guy all along, but also the most tragic character in the whole story. 
This emotionally distressed little girl, without a hope in the world, is comforted by this guy who we assumed was a creepy stranger, only to reveal that the homeless man was actually a tragic victim who lost everything to the monster like she did. He reveals his dark, traumatizing past where you feel sad for the guy. We feel sorry for this poor homeless man who lost his whole family to the villain and ended up roaming the streets as a lost man who nobody believes in as he desperately tries to prevent the house from killing more families. The homeless guy is supposed to be a tragic figure on par with the Switchman from Toy Train or the dead best friend from the shiny red bicycle. And yet, this actor still fails to carry on the heavy emotion. Yet even worse, this tragic character who opens up to this lost girl and reveals his tragic backstory is completely downgraded into an exposition monkey. Yeah, the homeless guy, who is one of R.L. Stein's most tragic characters ever, gets his backstory and character development turned into a poorly rushed out information dump on the magic house. This doesn't give him the layers to his character arc, but just exposits information for Danielle. This scene has the potential to make the poor man a fleshed out character, but his backstory is turned into a long exposition rant to explain away the magic house. I don't feel a thing for this guy in the TV version, precisely because the actor just can't carry the emotion we're supposed to be getting from this scene, and his personal tale is shoved aside, and it sucks. This entire exposition dump sucks, and I hate it. The saddest character in Don't Forget Me gets his dark and troubled past shafted for exposition on the stupid magic house. You ruined it, Nightmare Room. You ruined it. One of the most tragic scenes, and the emotion is totally drained from it. Big shock, Danielle doesn't believe the homeless guy and runs away, where she goes all the way back to the same house she was trying to get away from, making that whole scene of her running away from the house only to go back to the very same house completely pointless. This is how bad the writing is, people. Danielle runs away from the haunted house, gets zero help, and the only thing she got out of it was a long exposition dump from the crazy homeless guy about the haunted house, only for her to not believe him and run all the way back home, which was what she wanted to get away from. Thanks for wasting our time, Nightmare Room. All we got was an exposition dump from a ruined heart-wrenching scene. Oh, and not to nitpick some more, but once again, Danielle is not wearing her backpack, even though she was wearing it in her running shots again. Danielle tries asking her parents for help, but they have no memory of who she is. Then, despite not believing in the crazy homeless guy's theory earlier, Danielle now does believe in the crazy guy's explanation and tells her parents that this building is a memory house, erasing their minds, doing a total 180 from how she acted a few minutes ago. The pacing in this plot is just so unbelievable, isn't it? Danielle desperately attempts to prove that she's their child, but sees that all the family photos were altered without the kids in them at all. Luckily, Danielle remembers the picture she broke earlier in the episode, and somehow realizes that using it can help her out since the house can't alter stuff outside of it. Wait, what? 
This is the resolution, people. The house can't alter stuff outside of its walls, even though we know for a fact that the house can do this because we've seen it alter the minds of people outside of the building. But, by sheer dumb luck, Danielle recovers the picture she tossed out and shows it to her parents, making them remember that she and Peter are their true kids, restoring their lost memories. Yes, the house can't alter anything outside of the building, even though the house was able to alter the neighbor's mind and hack into the local school records to erase the existence of the children there. Okay, this is just getting plain bad. How do you completely forget about the powers of your main villain? Oh, who cares? The family happily reunites and head back down into the basement to save little Peter. Okay, okay, let's get real. Peter's ghost comes by to tell them his final goodbyes, but then the homeless guy comes in to help back them up. What? How did he get in? Did he just break into the house? Hey, Mr. Homeless Guy, if you can break into the demon house at any given time and wanted to stop it from killing more people, then why the hell didn't you break into it earlier and burn it down before new people ever moved into it? But I digress. The stranger tells them that Peter can only escape if he's remembered and wanted back. But, I kid you not, the poor guy also monologues how he's not meant for this world anymore and only wants to be among his family once more. And yes, he does it all in his bad, horrendous acting. You can tell how emotionally invested I am by the sound of my voice. I'm trying to save you all. For crying out loud, guy, a family is about to die and witness the death of their youngest child. Can you at least pretend to give a crap? This is supposed to be another emotional high point in the dark climax, but this guy's awful acting is ruining it. What could be the greatest moment in this whole story is destroyed by the guy acting as bland as that gay guy from the Cleveland show. So much time has passed since I slipped into the basement. My family, my friends, they're all gone now. Please, I just want to go back where I belong. Uh, let me guess. Don't worry, though. Danielle saves the day by showing the house the unchanged family portrait as proof that the Warner family remembers everything, causing the house to die and release Peter's lost soul. Then the homeless guy just kills himself. <laughs> what? Yeah, for no reason at all, and with almost zero buildup, the homeless guy just kills himself and feeds his soul to the house, where he dies with all the other lost souls. There is no explanation behind any of this. When I first watched this, I kind of thought that the homeless man was sacrificing himself to the memory house in order to save Peter's soul or spare the family from the building's wrath. But nope, 
he literally just kills himself without any rhyme or reason. Were we supposed to get the impression that the poor stranger was suicidal and wanted to die at this point? Because let me tell you, if that was the case, then this plot death was so badly botched. Not helping matters was, again, the guy's terrible acting. Maybe in the book, the homeless stranger was a bit suicidal about losing everything and wanted to die stopping the demon house, but this episode severely mishandles this character, so I'm more confused and don't feel that sad about it. Fail, Nightmare Room. Epic fail. So the homeless man regresses into a child ghost, feeds himself to the dying house, then dies himself. This was not a sacrifice, this was a suicide, because the house was already dying before he killed himself. Hooray! Unnecessary murder-suicide in this children's show. Having fun, kids? But who cares? The Warner family is happy and safe, promising to move away as soon as possible. But then we get to our twist ending. We cut to a time skip where a new family is moving into the memory house, but uh-oh, the parents seemingly ignore their little girl's existence before this sweet, cute, innocent child wanders down to the dark basement where the ghost house calls to her. As the episode closes out with the cycle of evil continuing once more. And that was the end to the first Nightmare Room story, Don't Forget Me. After all this horror, all this suffering, all this nightmare fuel, the family doesn't torch down that freaking murderous demon house and actually allows a whole new unsuspecting family move in and die. What? Are you for real? The Warner family knows this house is evil and actually moved away, but allowed a new batch of morons to move in and suffer the house's wrath. Heck, they don't even leave a note to warn the new attendants to beware the spooky building just in case. They just assume that the house is dead and move on with their lives, not burning that hell spawn to a crisp and leaving it alive to rebuild itself. Oh, I see how it is, writers. The Black family is expendable and can just die in the twist ending, but Amanda Bynes and her white family are the ones that unlock the happy ending. Couldn't let go of the black character always dies cliche, huh, Nightmare Room? In all seriousness, this ending does kind of irk me, since it makes no sense why the family didn't even tell people about the murderous demon house and just save themselves. Did they really assume that the memory house was permanently dead? In fact, how did the house come back to life? We see it self-destruct and fall apart, releasing Peter's soul and losing all its power. So the house wasn't really dead and it just allowed the Warner family to leave since killing them was too hard? What, did the house just fake its death to dodge its taxes? This whole twist ending could have been easily explained away with a single line here and there, but the show doesn't do that just to perform the ultimate predictable twist ending, where the horror story villain is alive and coming back to kill again. A very generic ending for even good horror stories, but one that barely makes sense on here. Whether you like it or not, that was the end to Don't Forget Me. What did I think about it? I've already forgotten it. This episode is a mess. A total, unbalanced, poorly paced out, emotionless mess. What happened? So many people told me that this was the saddest, emotionally gripping Nightmare Room story ever. And this was the final product? 
There is so much wrong with this adaptation. From the point of view of a novel fan, this story really fails hard at being as good as the book. Don't forget me, the episode leaves out so much good content from the original story and actually goes out of its way to add even more plot holes that were mostly covered up in the book. If you wondered how faithful it was as an adaptation, well, it wasn't. It really wasn't. It feels insulting how much it departs from the book since all the sad emotional scenes and complex horror storytelling are shoved aside for in-your-face booga 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 horror and jump scares. Some of the subtle scares and symbolic themes are still present, but not as strong as they were in the book. Which is a shame, because I do believe that The Nightmare Room can truly amount to being as great as Goosebumps and The Haunting Hour. Both those shows demonstrated that they can be unfaithful to the book versions of R.L. Stein's stories, but also provide the audience with something amazing in the end. It just pisses me off when a series fails to recapture that same magic, like Locker 13 or the After Hours remake. But let's talk about what good qualities this had. Don't Forget Me does have good ideas in it, and they all have serious potential for outstanding horror. The idea of children being forgotten by their parents and having their souls taken away was a concept that was beautifully done well by checking out and My Old House. All good ideas that were lost in this poor adaptation were salvaged by much better stories for The Haunting Hour. I'm glad that this episode's brilliant scares weren't squandered. The Warner family were all decent actors. Even Amanda Bynes showed she can do serious drama from time to time. Which did shock me, since I saw her mostly on All That and The Amanda Show, so I was impressed. The ominous vibes from the memory house are pretty creepy, and the idea of it luring children away and holding their souls in hell is very dark and super scary. However, that's mostly all I have. The homeless man was the biggest negative factor for me in this. From his wooden acting to his lack of emotional scenes, this guy was hands down the worst part in this. This guy was meant to be a tragic character on par with the Switchman from Toy Train, but this episode fails at that. He's given no depth as a character, his performance is piss poor, and all of his major scenes were transformed into blatant exposition for the real main characters. Also, the episode's continuity was bad and all over the place. This story actually plays out at a very nice pace in the beginning, but during the final act, everything falls apart. They rush the climax so fast that it feels very unfulfilling and confusing as to what we just saw. A story with a ton of plot holes sinks the whole ship. I'm sorry, but the inconsistencies in the plot did even more damage to it, since the book was slightly more thought out while the episode feels cramped without much breathing time. I'm not just talking about my minor nitpicks like Danielle's disappearing backpack or the wasted hypnosis subplot. I mean the house's powers. You just cannot change the story you establish if the plot demands it, and the house's powers were very noticeably altered, which raised more questions than scares. I'm not sorry, this plot was a mess, and any opportunity for something memorable is wasted to rush the narrative along. It costs this spooky story any fantastic magic. But the worst part of it all is that this episode is not all that scary. A lot of people did comment that they were scared of this story, but I sadly didn't find it that dark. Some of the weird plot holes and the homeless guy's bad acting kept overshadowing the decent horror moments for me. One thing that doesn't help is that the scares in Don't Forget Me have been done by better horror stories before and follows a little too many horror cliches. 
the naive family moving into a haunted house, the jump scares, the glowing ghosts, the ominous foreshadowing character, and that dumb twist where the villain is surprisingly alive and coming back for revenge have all been done before by much better horror stories, and Don't Forget Me doesn't do much to separate itself from them. I honestly can't remember the last time this villain is still alive twist was ever shocking or even remotely good. When was the last time I liked this twist? I think it was G.I. Joe Renegades with the Cobra Commander, but since that was an action cartoon, I don't really count it. Word of advice to all horror writers out there, don't simply end on the twist being that the horror monster is still alive and might get revenge. Either the villain comes back and kills their enemy, or leave it ambiguous. Just having the monster alive and possibly returning feels too much like cheap sequel bait. As dark as the ending is, it just isn't scary, much like this badly butchered plot. Sorry guys, but this episode wasn't all that creepy. Uh, let me tell you about scary kid. There's all kinds of scary kids. Don't Forget Me had so much great ideas in it that it feels like a waste that the show failed to live up to the awesomeness the book laid out for everyone. Maybe with some time and work, this whole story could be re-edited into something more, something of greater horror quality. Oh wait, we have Checking Out and My Old House. Never mind, go read the book version or just watch those Haunting Hour classics. This episode was a dud. So I give the Nightmare Room's first episode, Don't Forget Me, a bronze skull. This episode was not a great start for the series. If you like it, that's fine. It's not my robot or poop day from Maj Bad, but it is just a weak, weak letdown. Don't Forget Me, the episode is a dull, slow, cluttered, badly thought out mess. For me, the true starting point for the Nightmare Room was the second tale, Scareful What You Wish For. Don't Forget Me tried so hard to be a fun little horror adventure with strong emotional moments and serious scares, but it ended up being a broken, weak mess that deserves to be forgotten. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe, or just tune in for more videos posted here on Wolf Entertainment. I'm your host, Catastrophe, and I hope that you all remember that memory houses are stupid. No, they're not, and you all will forget that now. <laughs> huh? What was I talking about? Just that memory houses were a great idea, but don't forget me was mediocre at using them. Oh, right. I'm Catastrophe, and I love memory houses but not on Don't Forget Me. See you all next time. So, uh, what do I review next? I forgot. Don't worry, I got a special game for you. <laughs>
Whoa, slow down, guy. Where's all this raw emotion coming from? You weren't this awesome in the actual episode. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't, girlfriend. <laughs>